It's a cliche that the best is saved for last, but in this case, it might actually be the case. This next session is a very different session to some of the ones we've had earlier. This session is often given in smaller groups, um, and it's very interactive. It, there's a chance for you guys to talk to each other and talk to Willie Jackson, who's our next, uh, who's our facilitator of our next session. Um, this is called uh, the Ally Skills Workshop. It's being hosted by DEI consultant and facilitator Willie Jackson. Willie um, has been one of our best discoveries at From Day One. We've had him on, I think, every single conference we've done since we met him in, in uh, April in San Francisco. He joined us in Boston and Brooklyn, Denver, Dallas, and now in LA. Um, and this is a really thought-provoking and eye-opening session. It's about finding ways to position people of color and their allies to successfully undertake allyship at work and beyond. Uh, please welcome Willie Jackson. All right, this is a, an energetic transition. Delighted that folks are leaving the room. You're not dead to me, it's okay. It's no problem at all, I don't take it personal. Uh, uh, I do a lot of work in the diversity, equity, inclusion space, and one of the things I really appreciate about the From Day, from day One leadership, wow, that I'm definitely in the way here, uh, From Day One leadership is that they're, um, they're kind of applying a lot of this stuff. When I look at the descriptions of the conversations and the panels and so forth, they really are advancing a really vital conversation. So I just have a ton of respect for that in particular because a lot of the efforts that we make at our companies, as we know, um, are really tantamount to PR, right? What does it look like to look like we're talking about these topics? What does it look like to act like we're talking about these topics? How do we keep up with the conversations that many of the leading companies in tech are having? So I just wanna appreciate that because a lot of this work can feel like an effort around what it looks like to look like we're doing the work, as opposed to the hard work of putting these values into action. So um, it, it's somewhat rare. Uh, Willie Jackson here, as I say, I'm a professional African-American. I lost my fonts. <laughs> It's true. That went over better than I expected. Um, but it's true, I am a professional African American. Um, nearly 40 years of experience, 35 really. Uh, I lost my fonts, and so they're not beautiful. I just want to name that because it hurts me to look at this basic Arial. We'll talk about it later, but I just wanted to get that off my chest because it really matters, and this is not how I want to show up in the world. That being said, um, hope you're here for the Ally Skills Workshop because that's the only thing I'm offering. Um, I work for a small diversity strategy firm based in the San Francisco Bay Area called Ready Set. Wow, that was amazing. So it's a client and just generally happy people. Hi, um, that was wonderful. Um, we do some stuff. Some of these words on the screen might be true. Let's get to the, the reason we're here. Oh, not me. Um, that's true, I'm a professional, um, all those things that I said. Oh, this is great. I'm gonna, at some point, I'm gonna figure out how to work the stage, uh, but in the meantime, I'm gonna be fumbling around. Um, I'm the kind of introvert that comes alive with a microphone, so I'm having a lot more fun than you all are already, I assure you. Um, I started my career with a tiny company called Accenture once upon a time, back when they had a mere 193,000 souls. That was quite a ride, I quit. Um, I started an online magazine for black men called Abernathy about um, whatever 2015 was. I went to school for words, not math. And um, I really fell in love with, as I say, facilitating conversations across difference, reminding ourselves of what we have in common more so than what divides us, and really selfishly um, and unapologetically cherry-picking from history to really illuminate our complicated and shared history together as a way of realizing that we can actually do a lot better than we tend to do. Conversations across difference, conversations across race um, are difficult in in particular because of the political environment and our divisions, you know, practical uh, in, in our neighborhoods and so forth, but also because we're out of practice. It's challenging. So I, I love some of the conversations earlier about some of these interventions because we really do have to get in muscle memory what it looks like to intervene, to stand up for ourselves, to broach topics for the first time, and to figure out actually where we land on these topics. Um, thanks for letting me get that off my chest. I made books, I made magazines, I was on TV, let's move on. Some suggested community agreements for today. This probably isn't too terribly necessary for this sort of environment, but for those of you looking to carry this work into your organizations, I wanna model some of the rules and the, not just rules, but some of the containers that we can create. A lot of this work involves creating the conditions for more vulnerable, more powerful, more transformative conversations to take place, and these are some of the ways that we like to do this. So if you're the kind of person that has your answers ready to go, you already have your questions, your 
um, your response is ready. Maybe make space for your colleagues and your fellow conference mates who need a moment to gather the thoughts, right? Um, by all means, take the learnings out with you, saying nothing about the recording taking place. But anything personally attributable, anybody talking about their manager, let's leave that here in the room so we can have a nice, safe, cozy container for our conversation. Um, let's refrain from judgment. You know, nobody has this work nailed. Maybe Beyonce has this work nailed, but I don't, and none of you do. And I, I think the, the point is to um, really acknowledge when people are trying. We're having a conversation in our national discourse, personally, across teams, and so forth, and certainly in our industries that um, are fairly unprecedented, depending on where we work. So I'd love to extend some compassion and uh, ask for you all to do that as well um, as we try together. Um, recognize intent, but own impact. If you, uh, let's assume that people are coming from a good place when they ask their questions, but if something lands a little funky, let's own that, let's name that so we can move on, right? Let's validate that fact that harm has taken place, because that's, in fact, a part of this framework. Uh, and finally, if nothing, if, if something is unclear, um, ask me, raise your hand. I hope to have a conversation here, despite the fact that I'm the only one armed with the microphone. There are microphone runners available. Um, is that fair? Great. Uh, our objectives for today as follows. Um, number one, we want to distinguish between allyship and being an accomplice, right? What does that, wh what do those framings mean? What are we implying there? Why are we using somewhat subversive language uh, in this session on inclusion? Um, learning how to take action, right? This is not a framework born out of prevention. We really care about addressing what this work looks like in practice. And oftentimes, we're running between meetings, uh, we're moving too quickly, we're under deadline, and maybe we stick our foot in our mouth and we say something we don't mean, or something comes out the wrong way, you know, we're in a rush and we're accidentally racist. Um, it happens all the time, I understand. Um, so how do you bring your values to bear when you're in those moments? How do you recover with grace? Um, and how do you do that in a way that you're proud of, right? Because we might get it wrong the, f the first time, but how do we practice recovering in a way that brings our values to bear? Um, and, and finally, actually I said the finally, let's move on. Uh, I'd be curious, what are some words and phrases that come to mind when you all think of allyship? I can repeat it back so you can just holler out at me. Um, a champion, what else? What is it? Cheerleader, Cheerleader. what else? Uh, one more time. Friend. Friend. Sweet. What else? Supporter. Speaking, up. Supporter speaking up. Speaking up for whom? For someone who's not saying it. Love it. Yeah. What else? Empathy. Empathy. Advocate. 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 Wonderful. What else? Yes. Fighting for the same cause. For the same cause. Wonderful. Yeah, I think it's really useful to level set. One of the reasons we talk about the language is because a, as we know in this field, in this industry, words like diversity, equity, inclusion, allyship, belonging, and so forth mean different things to different people based on the bodies that we were born into and the communities and areas in which we were socialized. As I often say, if you go into any black barbershop or salon in the nation, nobody's talking about diversity and inclusion. Right? That's not how humans talk, right? These are corporate euphemisms that are kind of pointing towards what we mean, but we actually have to define what we mean because it's relevant to our operational context and our teams, as our company, in our companies, in our industries, and so forth. Um, by way of history, how many of you are familiar with the Combahee River Collective? Let's see one hand. Um, fabulous, maybe we'll learn something today. Um, this was a radical lesbian feminist black organization founded in Boston, active from, what, 1974 to 1980. Um, essentially, this really pioneered a lot of um, thinking and that, that ladders up to the intellectual groundwork that we now enjoy, a term that we'll get to momentarily. Um, famously, they were struggling against oppression on the basis of race, gender, and class. Yes? Kambahi, C-O-M-B-A-H-E-E, -E, River Collective. It'll be on the next slide. Um, thank you for your question. Um, they were fighting against oppression on the basis of race, gender, and class, but they also introduced to us the notion of oppression on the basis of sexuality. And these were analyzed as, the, as synthesized or as um, forces that were working together, not individual forces. So not just the fact of racism, not just the fact of sexism, not just the fact of, sex, of classism, but the way in which these things are working together, as they put it, created the conditions for their lives. It might also surprise, uh, oh, so famously, what I take away from them and what was significant about um, the legacy that they leave for us intellectually and practically in this field, um, they were fighting alongside black men to fight racism, but against black men to fight sexism, 
right? So this more expansive view of what it means to organize on the basis of our identity. Um, it might surprise some of us to learn that they originated the term identity politics, which has become a political talking point in our contemporary era. They said this focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. We believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics comes directly out of our own identity. On this conversation that was just on the stage on the panel about the Me Too movement and many conversations today, we're really taking a look at what it means to analyze what we need based on who we are, the bodies that we have, and what that means in terms of the broader power dynamics, our interactions with others, and so forth, right? So um, that's where that analysis um, leads into this term intersectionality. Um, how many of you have heard the term intersectionality before? How many of you want to take a microphone and define it for me? Yeah, I feel that way sometimes. Feels like, what does it mean again? Like, it makes sense, but how do I, how do I say it? Um, Kimberly Crenshaw is a critical race theorist, constitutional law scholar. She's at UCLA and Columbia, uh, I believe. Um, 30 years ago, Kimberly Crenshaw was looking at class action lawsuits filed by black women against General Motors. Um, she needed a legal framework to show the way in which race and gender were working together to create a new vector for oppression, um, because at the time you had to file as either a, a black person or a woman. Right? You had to pick your protected class. And famously, one of the judges throughout the cases, uh, one, one of the cases because he saw that General Motors employed white women and black men. So the, the takeaway and the best practice and the obvious thing is that um, the experiences of black women in the workplace can't be explained through the lens of black men or white women, right? There's, a, there's something unique happening. So Kimberly Crenshaw needed, needed a legal analysis and a legal framework to illustrate the fact that race and gender were doing something very special uh, when analyzed together, right? And so this term intersectionality, um, our working definition is, it's the interconnected nature of social categorizations, things like race, gender, uh, class, and so forth, and specifically the fact that they're regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. So it's not just any one of these things being true. It's the fact that they're true in particular ways for particular be people based on unique things that we can't get out of, right? The, the forces that are foist foisted upon us um, at a societal level and at a personal level. Um, so this analysis really informs how we can understand disability justice in the workplace. Um, the fact that different people are moving through our organizations differently. Why we reliably see certain scores on our employee engagement metrics when we cut data by race and gender. Um, and things get more and more bleak uh, depending on how we cut that data, right? So this gives us a lens to understand why that's true and what we can do about it. Um, we don't really have the greatest graphical representation of this, but it's at the intersections, at the margin. So if we think of race on one axis and gender on another, um, and, and of course many other axes, it's where these things are coming together that we are all having unique experiences and moving through the world. Um, so moving from ally to accomplice, that really is the core of this framework. Um, and I'll share why I think this framework might be a useful frame for us to move through. Um, if you're, uh, for example, called, if you're, um, sorry, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say it like this. Um, if you're invested in being seen as an ally, as, and you're invested in the optics of that, being seen in that way, and basically it's a euphemism for being a good person, um, you're deeply invested in that identity not being disturbed, right? If you wake up in the morning having decided on the basis of the privilege you've been afforded in life, um, what you see going on in the world, the inequity in the world, if you've decided um, that you want to show up in the world in this particular way, and your feeling that way is predicated on being seen that way, if you're called out, or called in, hopefully, uh, with, with compassion, if you're called out on the basis of something you've done to breach that contract you've made with yourself, it stands to reason that you might overcorrect. You might lash out at somebody when it's brought out to your attention. You say, you don't understand, you don't understand. And maybe you're talking to a marginalized person and you're exacerbating the very issue that was brought to your attention in the first place. If, by contrast, you're viewing your work as an advocate or an accomplice, as you like, it's a much more psychologically and emotionally resistant frame and one where there's a lot more spaciousness to learn. Uh, it's, in fact, a generous thing, or it can be a generous thing to be called out on the basis of a blind spot um, because you can do better next time. 
So if we look at some of the characteristics of an ally, um, that might be an identity. You know, that's the way that you see yourself. I'm, I, choose to, I choose to identify as an ally. I live in the Bay Area where there's a lot of pins and a lot of backpacks, and if you're a card-carrying member of the ally massive, the ally community, it's in your Twitter bio, you're really embodying that, then um, maybe this column is something that you identify with. An ally might be somebody who sees himself as an expert. They read all of Robin DiAngelo's books. They read everything that uh, Kimberly Crenshaw uh, writes. They know that she has a podcast and they subscribe to it. It's a great podcast. You should listen to it. It's called Intersectionality Matters. True story. Um, an ally could often, often center themselves in the conversation as well. So anytime uh, an inclusion conversation comes up in the workplace, um, they know all the statistics on pay equity. They're up to date on the Hollywood Report. They know exactly what to say, and you can't get a word in edgewise when you're talking about your lived experience. Maybe don't be that person. An ally could also be complacent in that identity. They woke, they woke up, they decided to be an ally, and nobody can tell them otherwise. And in many ways, the work is done, right? They have arrived at a place where they've decided. Um, an accomplice, by contrast, instead of viewing their work as an identity or themselves as having the ally identity, it's saying, what does my allyship look like in practice? What does it mean to take this knowledge um, that I've received and put it into practice for reforming how I interact with other people, how I analyze power, um, how I analyze the inequity in my workplace, and what I can do about it, right? And what am I doing in practice? An accomplice is an active listener, right? We, we know in broad strokes why the Me Too movement started and what caused it to spill into the public consciousness and, and ignite this really vital and long overdue national discourse. But we don't know what it's like for everybody in all rooms, in all situations. Power dynamics vary wildly, right? So an accomplice is always listening for the thing that they might not know that could inform their advocacy um, for and on behalf of somebody else. Uh, we need a North Star in this work, as I say. Um, we can't save all people in all directions all the time, every day. We actually need a way of prior prioritizing our efforts. And for that, we recommend centering impacted communities, right? Um, and finally, above all, I, I think the key characteristic that all of this rests on is the notion that uh, we can make a mistake. Right? We are not perfect and that we can learn from that. When we have an empowered and a generous frame around the fact that we know that we can make a mistake, um, I, I think it represents the building blocks of success, or possibility at least. Does that make sense? Anything coming up for folks? Any questions? Any ideas coming to mind? I'd love to get some conversation going. Um, it's totally fine if you don't want to talk to me. I don't take it personal. Cool. I'll catch you in a few slides. Um, so what does an accomplice do? center impacted communities, we take action, we use our privilege and we exhibit humility. Um, okay, we've got a little sound on this one. I'll give the sound man a beat. He's ready, he was born ready. You're ready in Boston. Maybe the video man, oh no. He's not playing. You know what happened? Maybe. What a bummer. <laughs> All right, so guy walks into a bar, and uh, so we're going to watch a short video on Octavia Spencer talking about a particular challenge. So this is really relevant to the, the Hollywood uh, diversity report and so forth. And this is a really powerful exchange where Octavia Spencer is sharing something that she has nev had never shared before. So it's a short video, and we can provide, I, I can probably share the re a resources document with the From Day One folks to, to share it for those of you who are interested. There's actually, a, actually there's a QR code at the end if you want to snap it towards the end, and I, I can send you these. Um, all the videos and, and the books and things that I mentioned here. Um, but it's really useful to bring alive what it means to put this work in practice. And uh, again, you know, with the frame around intersectionality, we're not having a simple conversation around race uh, or just gender. We have to analyze things like power and privilege and what it means to, you know, despite many of the privileges that we've been afforded, um, what it looks like to advocate for ourselves and for others. All right, I'll say some more words. For example, um, I hold a historically marginalized identity. I'm the descendant of enslaved folks. My grandparents were sharecroppers, and my father was born in 1944 and picked cotton in the segregated South. Pretty wild. Um, when I was 22, I bought a 3,600 square foot house in the Atlanta suburbs. 
Right? So I can very much see the American dream as embodied in my bloodline. Um, but I also live in the age of Trayvon Martin, Rakia Boyd, Mike Brown, and so forth, right? So there, there is the du that duality. I also have the privilege of doing this work for a living, talking to audiences like you, and sharing my story in a real and authentic way that doesn't, that doesn't require me to compromise who I am on the basis of the body that I was born into. That's a tremendous amount of privilege. I has a, have a lot of physical uh, privilege. I'm a tall, able-bodied, straight male. Um, I, I'm, I'm large as well. I don't get talked over in meetings. I don't get disrespected in the way that some of my colleagues might. And I'm able to use that privilege in different situations when I see things take, you know, issues taking place. Um, redirecting attention if one of my female colleagues is being talked over, for example. Or if I'm walking one of my colleagues um, uh, from one building to another, and they happen to be female, they, uh, they say, you know, no street harassment today. That's a real quote. Um, <laughs> and like, you know, I, have, I don't have the same physical safety concerns that a lot of people do. Um, right? Nobody's throwing Willie Jackson in the back of a van. That's just not happening. It would be a bad day for everyone, as I say. Um, so, like, I, I don't, it, it matters to recognize where we feel both the potential to have oppression and the potential to have privilege, because these things coexist, and that's the world that we live in. So one of the reasons it's so useful to have a nuanced conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion, allyship, belonging, intersectionality and what these concepts and forces mean to us personally is because we can't simply adopt a frame around feeling empowered or disempowered. You know, we might have privilege on one day or maybe in one meeting and might feel completely different and uh, downtrodden and overlooked and steamrolled uh, in the next meeting. You know, a conversation with one of our, um, our superiors or somebody that we report into, right? So these things really, really matter. Um, okay, how are we doing? Doing great? Great? Want to try it? We're going to keep going. I'm, I'm getting the move on. Um, how, do we, how do we best do this? Is anybody familiar with this? Um, this I can't go backwards. Is anybody familiar with what, what this takes place? Oh, I so wish I could show you this video. Uh, we'll come back to it. I mean, we probably won't come back to it, but I feel like that's the kind of thing that you say. Uh, moving on. How many of you recognize this handsome guy? Uh, how about when he's dressed up for work? Yeah, that's, that's Thor from the uh, Marvel franchise. Um, in 2016, he did something awkward. Let me point to him real quick. That's him. I appreciate that laugh. I'm such a... Um, anyway, uh, he did something uh, unfortunate. Um, so some, for some reason, I don't get invited to parties like this, but this was a Lone Ranger party, um, which is apparently a thing. And he dressed up as a Native American. And um, as many of us are learning in 2019, apparently, or I guess 2016, that's not okay. You don't do that. That's, that's, that's not okay. Um, and he did something unexpected afterwards. Uh, who wants to guess what he did? That's exactly right. He apologized. Um, uh, should I read this for you? All right, I'll do it. Uh, last New Year's Eve, I was at a Lone Ranger themed party where some of us, myself included, wore traditional dress of First Nations people. I was stupidly unaware of the offense this may have caused and the sensitivity around this issue. Welcome to Earth. Um, I sincerely and unreservedly apologize to all First Nations people for this thoughtless action. I now appreciate that, that there is a great need for a deeper understanding of the complex and extensive issues facing Indigenous communities. I hope that in highlighting my own ignorance, I can help in some small way. I'd actually like to hear from, from you all. How does this land for you? I shouldn't have added my cheeky comment there because I've definitely biased some, if not all of you, but how does this land for you? Uh, he definitely did not write that as the, is the, the comment I heard. As I sometimes jokingly you know, put, a well-paid team of interns crafted this wonderful, um, I don't know if he actually wrote this. So, a little skepticism, what else? I'm sorry, inauthentic? What makes it inauthentic? Okay, okay, uh, the, so the comment was the term First Nations people, which is in fact the, the correct terminology that we would use, um, throws this person off because you can't, the, the um, what is the word I'm looking for? The paradox of somebody making this egregious mistake and then using the correct terminology um, afterwards is, uh, is, is quite a distance to close. I, I, I can hear that, please. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. So uh, I think there are some questions around the motivation for doing it, but it seems clear if these are his words, and I actually believe they might be, um, that somebody has, ha has pulled him to the side, as we used to say in the South. Please. Sorry, I, I, let's try one more time. Sorry. Hello. Oh. Um, I actually like the last part because he's not trying to uh, hide it. He's saying, you know, like, if, at least I can help other people understand this is not appropriate instead of just making a statement and then hoping it goes away. So um, that's what I felt when, I, when you read it. That's actually one of my favorite parts of this apology. Um, given our political environment, you can practically see the legions of angsty, hormonal, 15 and 16 year old boys in the parents' basement. Um, it's a very specific you know, vision I'm trying to paint. Um, looking to people like him for examples of what masculinity looks like. There is a strain of masculinity that says, never back down, never apologize, <laughs> throw up your hands in response. What do I do, what do I do? I love the, the guy on the previous panel, it's hilarious. Um, you try it? Um, so I, I, I appreciate him, well, I didn't know we are gonna cut to it so aggressively. Let's watch the video! It's gonna like trend. Well, I have a story, and you guys are gonna be the first to hear it. Um, <laughs> about 15 months ago, Jessica Jassain, uh we're really good friends and we had such a great time working on The Help. Uh, she wants to do comedies and I want to break out of period pieces. So, uh, <laughs> I love them, they've been kind to me. But I kind of want to play someone who resembles me in some fashion. Um, and uh, so she contacted me and she said, I want us to do a comedy. And I'm like, yeah. And uh, it, you know, she had an idea and um, she went off to work, I went off to work. Um, she called me maybe six months later, which would have been uh, like last March. And we were talking about pay equity and uh, with men and women. And she was like, it's time that women get paid the same as men. I'm like, yeah, Jessica, it's time. <laughs> and you know, we were you, dropping F-bombs and you know, getting it all out there. And then I said, but here's the thing, women of color, on that spectrum, we make far less than white women. So we're gonna have that conversation about pay equity. We gotta bring the women of color to the table. And I told her my story and we talked numbers and she was quiet and she had no idea that that's what it was like for women of color. And so she said, I'm probably gonna, I don't know, these are happy tears. <laughs> I love that woman because she's walking the walk and she's actually talking the talk. She said, Octavia, we're gonna get you paid on this film. I said, I, I would love to do your film, but here's the thing, I'm gonna have to get paid. And then <laughs> she said, we're, of course, and you and I are gonna be tied together. We're gonna be favored nations and we're gonna make the same thing and you're gonna make that amount. And fast forward to last week, we're making five times what. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Jessica Chester believes she she is walking the walk. That's great. And we want to. I mean, I, now I want to go to what the men are making. <laughs> I want to get there. Yeah. But right now, it feels really good just to be in that right. conversation. Is the that's the last word she was going to say there. Um, Uh, what did you notice in that video? Um, I'm gonna go back to the slides. Um, yeah, please, what, what did you notice in that video? There we go. Nope. Ooh, all right, that's a punchline. What did we notice in the video? Yeah, please. So good. I love that we're still mad at Chris Hemsworth on, after watching this video. Um, I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the whole, like, the whole conversation, the whole framework is like, what are you responsible for now that you know? Like, what does it mean to put action behind this? And in case, in, the, in this case, a tremendous amount of solidarity. Thanks for hustling to get the video twerking, gents. Um, what else do we notice here? 
what elements of the accomplice allyship framework do we see embodied in the story about Jessica Chastain specifically? Or I'll ask you it like this. What is the very first thing Octavia Spencer said that Jessica Chastain did? The very first thing upon the revelation that there's this enormous racial and gender disparity. Uh, I'm sorry? Whoa, 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 whoa. She didn't know. And how was that not knowing evidenced? She was silent. She didn't say anything. She specifically didn't do what? She didn't explain it, explain it away. She didn't justify it. She said, well, maybe you didn't X, Y, Z. I mean, and like, let's, let's just call it, you know, let's call it like it is. One of these women is an, uh, an award-winning Hollywood actress, and the other woman is Jessica Chastain, right? Like, there's, like, one person is, like, you know, I, I just, like, so, and I, I say that not just to be cheeky. I'm definitely being cheeky, because that's the part of who I am. But um, the power and the optics and the racial politics matter, right? In, in this example, it took Jessica Chastain, who in some ways has not um, achieved the level of success that Octavia Spencer has in some ways, you know, with the award-winning status, um, but the fact of her identity really, really matters because of proximity, because of power, because of the demographic and racial composition of who holds power, and all of the things that we internalize and that we know, but that we don't necessarily have a conversation about. So the first thing Jessica Chastain reportedly did is she was quiet. So she not only didn't justify it, she not only didn't explain it away, she not only um, didn't push back against it being true, all of these things are really important because there's a phenomenon around not believing people when they say things take place, specifically and especially black women in the workplace. So there was the, the fundamental and essential validation of that experience and the fact that it was true. Um, and she also didn't defend or deflect. She also didn't just have, didn't pay lip service to it. She said, oh wow, that's really terrible. Um, I'm devastated about this. I'm going to think about this, and I, I, you know, I might cry myself to sleep at night. She didn't just play this lip service. She actually did something about it. What else did she do, or what else did you notice? They talked numbers. They got real, right? They, they, there was transparency and there was trust there. And these weren't just strangers, right? This, these were two friends who have worked together. They enjoy each other's company, apparently. They were having a conversation. Um, and Jessica Chastain was super fired up about the gender pay equity conversation. And Octavia Spencer had to do something really risky and really challenging, which is to say, I hear you. I'd love to sign your petition, but I have to tell you something that you might not know. Right, so that kind of trust, it says a lot about the kind of relationship they have, the kind of trust they have, and the kind of space um, that they've made. Um, who's telling this story? You know, as I say, are we on the Jessica Chastain, White Savior TED Talk Power Hour? No, it's Octavia Spencer owning the narrative, talking about it, and sharing it, in this case, what seems to be like the, the, the very first time. Um, and again, it wasn't just lip service, there was action taken. She tied her contract together. She said, when you win, I win. You know, we're going to be in this thing together. So I, I think we need to think more creatively about what it means to show solidarity, um, to think creative about what solutions to some of these societal problems around equity and compensation look like, and to have a more courageous frame for these things. So I love this story, not only because it has a, a somewhat happy ending, um, but I actually shouldn't even, I shouldn't even frame it like that, because you know, in one of the in one of the conversations where I facilitated this, con th this discussion, um, one of the, the people of color was a black man. He was really challenged by the idea that it, it, it took, um, it, it essentially it took a white woman's solidarity for Jessica Chastain to get the thing that she deserved in the first place. Like, to Jessica, Octavia Spencer, right? To get what she deserved in the first place, right? And so this lived, her entire lived experience, you saw how emotional she was. She had internalized a, life, a lifetime of both being successful and striving to where she had reached, but also knowing that she wasn't getting what she could have if she was simply born into a different body, right? So that paradox, specifically the psychological toll that that takes on people of color when we're having these conversations around inclusion, actually looms large as well. So it's, I, I corrected myself because it's not fair to simply call this a happy ending. It's actually evidence of a much larger, much more systemic challenge that we have a glimmer of hope in the context of. Does that make sense? Great, we've talked about this guy, that guy too. Um, I don't know, should we wrap up this conversation? Um, one of the things I do appreciate is that he used the correct terminology for First Nations people 
and indigenous communities. So this statement is correct. Somebody over here said it. Like this statement is correct. There is a great need for a deeper understanding of the complex and extensive issues facing indigenous communities. But to the point, one of the things lacking here, and I don't see this as a crit, I, well, I guess this is obviously criticism, but like putting my practitioner hat on, um, like what do you do with this knowledge here? What are some things he could have done? You know, could you insist that 10% of all of the films that you work on in the future are staffed by folks from indigenous communities? You could do that with the power and access and privilege and leverage that he has. These are the types of things that we can do. So I, don't, I didn't put this up here to, to bash him. I've learned in doing this conversation that people generally aren't buying this. Um, but I will point out what he did next. He lent his star power to protesting in full Thor regalia, um, the, Dakota, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, that's the director of Thor 4 and Thor Ragnarok on our right, his left. Um, so who knows what he did behind the scenes? We've come to find out that Keanu Reeves has been funding you know, children's hospitals for what the better part of a decade. There's a lot of things moving around behind the scenes. I don't presume to know Chris Hemsworth, how he lives his life, whether or not he's come to my workshops. I haven't seen him. Um, but um, so we'll, I don't want to say give him the benefit of the doubt, but I just want to, I want to articulate the limitations of my analysis because there's a lot that I just don't know. Um, but we all know that there's probably more that could be done particularly when it comes to repairing harm. Um, video, click, your way, my way. Hi, Everybody right. that's outside this building. Oh, sorry. That's so homeless. Uh, nothing but. Sorry. Uh, in 2016, uh, an unarmed black man, you know stories great when you include the phrase unarmed black man. Um, in 2016 in Sacramento, an unarmed black man named Stefan Clark um, was killed in his grandmother's backyard. Um, he was shot in the back while holding a cell phone. It's like, you know, it's about as bad as it gets. Um, no charges were announced afterwards, as these things go. And there's his brother in the courtroom here. And we're going to take a look at what happened uh, following an uprising in the courtroom. And I'd like you to pay attention specifically to who's moving, what they're doing. And we're going to have a conversation about it in a moment. Everybody that's outside this building that's homeless have been nothing but neglected and disrespected by your coward. You hear what I'm saying? You's a coward. I sat there and I read Sacramento B and you talk about all these millions and millions of dollars, right? That's what you talk about, right? I mean, could you watch your language? Oh, no, no, no. Why didn't you tell me that? You know what? You know what? Yes, that part. You know what I'm let's be, let's, let's keep this real. smooth. I like that. It's fade out. I see you. Um, I guess I was not on pitch for this video. Um, why is this video so hard to watch? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can, can you say that again just really quickly with the mic? Um, I said it's hard to watch because we know exactly what could have happened. Um, I think we've all seen it a million times at this point. Um, and we know what would have happened in that courtroom with cameras rolling if he didn't have all of those white bodies standing around him at the barricade. Um, when he was shit, thank you, that's exactly right. Um, what do we notice about what took place in the video? What stands out most uh, to folks? What did you notice? There was a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurt there. 
All right, so some of the analysis of this video is, you know, is this the most productive way to express that? Um, you know, uh, what happens next? You know, what's the point of, you know, raising all this hell in the courtroom? And, you know, the, the, that's kind of an interesting inquiry. Um, but I, I'm like you, I hear a tremendous amount of pain uh, and rage and harm having been perpetuated. Um, he's talked about how many times he's been arrested. You know, we know uh, based on, you know, some of the reports that the Justice Department has put out about the way that um, many police organizations work in these municipalities is, you know, they are effectively, you know, surveilling these poor communities of color. Um, you know, I, mean, I, I see this, I live in Oakland, you go to parts of East Oakland, they're just police cruisers going through uh, the, these neighborhoods. You know, the, the, these places feel occupied. And these aren't places where justice tra traditionally breaks in favor of the people that live there, right? So there's an institutional way in which justice um, doesn't always go in the way that we might hope. Um, what else do we notice in the video? Yeah, please. my power to stop that thing, your language is uncomfortable for me. Or not, like, don't speak your truth, just until, you can speak your truth until it's awful. Uh, uh, we're gonna come back to that in a, in a moment. Thank you for naming that. So like, is he, was he uh, speaking his, actually let's, let's talk about physically what happened in the video. Talk about the intervention. Well, I, some of this was alluded to there. There were a group of non-black folks that intervened. There was some direct action intervention here. Um, and it's really important to notice the, the racial politics there, specifically the fact that it was non-black folks per providing that intervention. And let me ask an obvious question. Why is that important? Why does that matter? The oppressed can't protect the oppressed. We're dealing with power here. We're dealing with the real lives. We're dealing with what we know typically happens. You know, black folks in this country has not, have not traditionally had agency over their bodies, over their safety, and so forth. So those folks had privilege in the courtroom in a way that black folks did not, and they advocated for him. When he got up on the microphone, was he speaking the Queen's English? Was he in his Banana Republic button down? You couldn't even let me get through that sentence. No, he was giving him hell. He let him know exactly how he felt. There was a lot of pain, anger, rage, hypocrisy. And their advocacy, their physically putting their bodies on the line was not predicated upon respectability. They didn't say to him, all right, we've got your back if you say it like this, right? He spoke his truth. In fact, they said, leave him alone. Why didn't you tell me not to talk like that? Those are some of the comments that I've heard, um, that, that I heard in the background. And I mean, it, it's important to talk, like we're not just talking about the courtroom dynamic. Conversations across difference in our personal lives, in our workplaces, et cetera, reliably break down across cultural differences when people of color are communicating their truth in a way that makes dominant group folks uncomfortable. There are different cultural values at work. Many communities of color uh, communicate with a lot of whatever this motion represents, whatever this motion represents. Like there's, a, there's a lot of um, um, energy, shall we say. Um, and so when things aren't communicated in a polite, respectful way, some white people lose their minds. And that's kind of what I figured I would just cut to the chase on the punchline there. I was using a lot of flowery language. Yeah, but it, um, it really upsets the balance of things and we saw what, what took place. That situation could have looked very differently without um, some of the things that were in place. So I wanted to illustrate this, not just because I want people to join the next protest um, or put their body on the line or put themselves in harm's way unnecessarily. Um, but we have to figure out what's in our inventory. What do we have to offer? Is that proximity? <clears throat> is that confidence? Um, is that the ability to speak truth to power? Is that an experience uh, navigating the legal or judici judicial system? What do you have to offer the cause that you can put forward? Um, and, and again, like, I'm not asking everybody to do this. My mother lost two brothers to street violence growing up. They were breaking up fights. Like, I made a promise to my mom when I went away to college that I wouldn't break up fights despite having the frame for it. I could, I could really get in there. I would love to. Um, but that has come at tre tremendous harm uh, for my family, right? So I've made a promise that I won't intervene in that particular way. So I do workshops. <coughs> I shouldn't have made that joke. That was terrible. Um, so what can go wrong besides everything? 
Um, how many of you heard the term white fragility? How many of you, raise your hand nice and high if you have not? You're uncomfortable already, I understand. Uh, I'm gonna read an abstract. This is Dr. Robin DeAngelo. She's a sociologist who coined the term years ago. She wrote a paper on it originally called White Fragility. And uh, in 2017, I believe, she wrote a book on it. Look at her, she's very nice, I imagine. Um, I'm gonna read the abstract of this phenomenon. White people in North America live in a social environment that protects and insulates them from race-based stress. This insulated environment of racial protection builds white expectations for racial comfort, while at the same time lowering the ability to tolerate racial stress, leading to what Dr. Robin DiAngelo calls white fragility. White fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. These behaviors, in turn, function to reinstate white racial equilibrium. We saw a little bit of that in the courtroom video. We see a little bit of this all the time. Um, the point of this isn't to talk about, isn't to shame people, isn't to bring attention to things in a way that's awkward or unnecessary or gratuitous, but we need to talk about the way that racial power operates. One of the ways that we can have better conversations across difference is by understanding the forces at work, analyzing these from a sociological perspective, and accommodating um, the, the reality that we operate in, right? So Robin DiAngelo's work can be a really useful kind of wayfinder for all of us. A lot of people of color are implicated in this phenomenon by being enrolled into, I was called, you know, somebody called me racist. It's like, Jerome, I'm not racist, right? Tell me I'm not racist. And then he's, you've got a hostage situation because Jerome, <laughs> Jerome wants to keep his job, and you know, so, uh, I, I mean, I, I shouldn't, I, I'm not trying to trivialize it, but we can reflexively look to people of color, people with marginalized identities for reassurance that we're not bad people, and that enrolls them into a, a place where they're upholding your comfort at the expense of you maybe having some insight into behaviors you're having or perpetuating that are harmful. So this book is a really good look at how it operates um, at, in some of its worst examples, how it operates in some of its most subtle and insidious examples, and what we can do about it. She should pay me for this plug. That was really good. Um, so what have we internalized along the way? Uh, with seven minutes and 59 seconds to go. All right, let's do this. Um, I'm a product of the homophobic, patriarchal South. Um, hello, my name is Will Jackson. Um, I grew up in, you know, I, I grew up in North Florida. And my journey has been one of unlearning what comes along with that territory. How many of you, by show of hands, have, uh, grow, grew up in a context where you had to unlearn some things that might have been okay at the dinner table, but are completely unacceptable? Does anybody want to share? <laughs> I saw the hand go up and down. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear somebody I haven't heard from. Yes, please. Well, I'm from Atlanta, too, and I still live there. And uh, we, of course, grew up with lots of uh, issues about race that we've had to unlearn. Uh, we've had to un or starting to unlearn the chop, which is, uh, I'm sure, offensive to, uh, uh, I want to say, indigenous peoples, First Nation uh, people. But anyway, is that what you were asking? Totally valid. Yeah, totally fair. Yeah, um, somebody else want to share a context in which they've grown up that they had to unlearn some unsavory characteristics from? Uh, Guillermo Gonzalez. I grew up in a Latismo, machismo kind of patriarchal, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely homophobic uh, kind of uh, environment. So yeah, you definitely have to unlearn those things uh, as you, you know, go through your journey and meet different people and realize they're they're not the devil the way that you know your family culturally and religiously thought and taught you to think. It's super real. I mean, it's, it's challenging. I mean, we all see jokes and conversations going by our desk that we neglect to intervene around. Like, we don't want to be ostracized. We don't want to fling ourselves unwittingly into content. We want people to have the realizations in ways that don't cause us discomfort. And we all have to make that choice and make that decision. It's deeply personal. The thing I say about diversity, equity, and inclusion work is um, if you're doing it right, it will change you. Right? You can't be the same person if you're really understanding how these things, these ideas and memes uh, affect people. Um, Ibram X. Kendi um, is the director of, a, I think, a race and policy center at American University. He wrote a book called Stamped from the Beginning, 
um, The History of Racist Ideas, and he followed that up with a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. He's a black man. During the course of writing this book, Stamp from the Beginning, well, I'll, 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 let me just tell you what, the, what Stamp from the Beginning is about. He's put forth the idea, I'll try that again in English. He put forward the idea that racist ideas come after racist policies. It's not that racist ideas come first and then racist policies come after that. It's that we look afterwards to justify decisions that we've made on the basis of, for example, economics. When you look at Christopher Columbus's journals and him first making contact with native people, um, he described them as being beautiful and handsome and interesting. He admired them and their culture. When the conquest became about gold, he started chopping their ears off. And they needed a meme to justify this. When the Portuguese needed labor, and they enrolled Africans into that, they needed a meme to justify that dehumanization. And so the, the, the narrative around African folks being barbarians and less than humans started there, right? It came afterwards, that, that wasn't first. So this notion that we justify the inequity in reverse or afterwards is the idea that Ibram Kendi is putting forth. And I wanna invite us to think about the way in which we tend to justify the un, uh, unfortunate, unfair, unequal aspects of society because it's too uncomfortable uh, to realize that we've gone along with something that is reliably disadvantaging uh, people that don't deserve it. Um, social roles and expectations. You know, if you're a tall, square-jawed white male, you grew up in an affluent family, you work really hard, by the time you get your second or third job, you're gonna feel like the world works in a particular way because you only have your experience. Um, if you grew up low income, single family home, um, w in a depressed economic situation, et cetera, and maybe you're a woman of color, by the time you get your second or third job or promotion, you will have internalized a completely dead of different set of sig signals and circumstances around your value, your worth, what you deserve, what you can say, what it's okay to stand in, what's a, what it's okay to advocate for, and so forth. So there's this concept of distance travel that I really love. And it, you know, it, it's, it's basically, you know, if you grew up in a household where you talked about, about money around the dinner table, uh, you could take it, you could, um, you had the resources to um, take advantage of college preparatory classes, so you could, you know, get a great SAT, LSAT, ACT score, whatever. Um, if you were able to go through college or university without needing to take a job, if you were able to work without sending money back home and supporting your family, um, if you were able to take a lower salary upon graduating from college because your family was in a particularly comfortable position or you had a place to stay or what have you, there's so much privilege privilege like baked into that experience and many people simply don't enjoy these things. When we look at the way that money and wealth operates in this country, what we see is that many immigrant communities, uh, people of color and so forth, as they get higher in their career, they start sending money back home. And that's a cultural imperative for many communities, right? When dominant group folks grow in their career and they get older, they often inherit wealth. So these, these disparities about our income are magnified based on what's culturally salient, right? These things really matter. How money moves is something we need to talk about as well because it means different things to different people. And we have all this, these, um, these feelings tied up in our value, our worth, what we can advocate for. We should move on, we've got two minutes left. So what happens when we feel attacked? What we know, um, and by feel attacked, I mean when we feel called out, when we feel embarrassed, when we feel ashamed, when somebody tells us that joke was racist, which we knew, we just were mad that they didn't laugh at it. Um, cortisol and adrenaline rise in the bloodstream. The body goes into a fight, flight, or freeze response, right? And we feel ashamed, right? And then we're primed biologically to get out of there, right? So it, it, the reason we need to practice these things, and the reason why I love the comments before in the previous panel about practicing uh, these conversations, is we don't rise to the level of our hopes and our values, we sink to the level of our training. We have to actually practice how we're gonna respond to stress-inducing situa situations uh, because we're not primed to do that. So what can you do? Um, educate yourself, expose yourself to media, um, stories that weren't necessarily written for you, um, conversations that make you feel uncomfortable and so forth. Um, consent is super, super vital. Just because you see something taking place or something um, that you deem as not okay doesn't mean that that person wants you to advocate on their behalf. It's really useful to get buy-in. It's vital, and the best practice is here, it's vital that people, yes, people with marginalized identities are able to advocate for themselves and stand up for themselves, right? Um, follow and support leaders from marginalized groups 
to protest and when, you org when, when there are organizers and so forth. There's a way that these things work. Fall in line that way. Um, follow your discomfort. I mean, as I say, if something makes you uncomfortable, I ask you to sit with that discomfort and see if it has something to offer you. Um, and when you make a mistake, apologize, correct yourself, and move on. Don't explain to the trans person how you grew up in West Virginia and, you know, this is okay then. Like, nobody cares. Like, just apologize. Don't create a hostage situation. This sign right here says I've got 15 seconds left, so folks, I'm going to put this pointer down. I'm going to stop talking, and thank you very much for your time and attention. So this is a wrap, and I'm the last person standing between here and um, sort of happy hour, so I'll keep it quick. Um, we've done eight of these conferences, and diversity is such a huge topic, and oftentimes I think, now I get it, and I'm really getting it, and then we'll, we'll speak, and I think, oh, I didn't get that. Um, there's always something, something new. And he really has grace under pressure um, dealing with uh, technological snafus, too. Um, I want to thank you all for dealing with these sensitive topics um, with a lot of insight, but also irreverence and humor. I don't know if it's LA compared to maybe, say, Boston, but uh, this is one of the most uh, entertaining conferences we've had, and um, it, was, it was a lot of fun besides all the learning we did. So thank you all, and uh, please have a beverage on us. Thank you.